so my name is Sean Whitley. Um, I'm an employee of the MITRE Corporation. Um, most of you probably have not heard of us because we are what's known as a federally funded research and development corporation uh, in the United States. And so what that means is we are funded by the United States government to do research and uh, other engineering activities solely for the benefit of the U.S. government or uh, in the case of things like attack, publicly releasing it for the community itself. Uh, so we don't sell things or we don't make things really. Uh, I am actually an American, if you could not tell from my accent, uh, but I am located in Germany. And so um, I actually do a lot of work with uh, African countries as well. Um, I have a master's degree in information security and assurance uh, from George Mason University uh, in the United States. Uh, and I've been doing this work for about nine plus years. Uh, and all that time I have been with the uh, MITRE Corporation. So it's been a while. Uh, during my tenure here, I have authored several papers on threat-based defense. And I, as part of my job, conduct these sorts of training activities uh, on how to implement threat-based defense. Uh, so we are here to talk about attack. Uh, so, so the first question is for what is attack? Um, people who have been in the cybersecurity community for a while uh, may have heard of it. Some of you may be very familiar, some not. Uh, so this is gonna go, go into great detail about attack, what it is, uh, how you can use it, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, and if we have time at the end, um, I'll go into actual the actual attack site and we can click through some things and um, also go to the attack navigator and maybe create some heat maps. Uh, but we'll have to see how we are on time. Uh, so attack is a framework that we have uh, shared with the cybersecurity community for, I think we released it about seven-ish years ago. Um, and so since that time, it's been gaining more and more popularity within the cybersecurity community as a way of talking about adversary activity. Uh, the diff way different teams use it varies, uh, but that's part of the power of the framework itself is that it is not uh, stuck in being used in one particular use case. Uh, we usually talk about four use cases, which we'll get into later, uh, but we sort of did a, on this slide, we have a quick overview of what that kind of looks like. You know, you can use it for finding gaps in your defenses. Uh, you can use it to plan threat emulation activities. Um, you can use it to help digest uh, cyber threat intelligence and enables you and uh, teams and organizations uh, to share all that information between the different teams despite possibly, despite definitely having different uh, jobs or different educational backgrounds. Uh, so this is the core structure. It's not very complex. It's um, only three sections. The actual training is much more broken down. Uh, but in terms of the high level organization, uh, the first section we'll be talking about understanding what attack is and where it's come from. So you'll get a little bit of the history. Um, in section two, uh, we'll start talking about the benefits of using attack. So why would an organization want to even use it and what purpose might it serve and how it might improve their a job. And then in section three, we'll talk about how to actually operationalize attack. So how does a CERT or a SOC or another team start using it to actually do something? So uh, any questions about that before we start? I don't see anything or hear anything. Uh, so let's get started. Section one, understanding attack. Uh, this is what attack looks like. And so when you see people talk about attack or see it presented as we are now, this is usually the view you see. It is the classic uh, tabular format where we have tactics across the top and techniques running down the bottom. And we'll go down into a little more detail, uh, but then when we're talking about attack, this is the summary sort of view uh, we're often referring to. Let's take a step back first and uh, really understand where, what problem attack is trying to solve. 
Um, so we all know there are dangerous threats out there. And if all it takes is a quick look in the news on perhaps any given day, and there's a good chance you'll see something about a new compromise, a new attack, anything like that, and it's happening all the time. And we've been trying to do network security defense for as long as we've had computer networks or computer systems. You know, we've had passwords, we have different authentication mechanisms, different ways to try to validate people's identities and keep the wrong people out of the systems. And we continue to fail, at least fail from the perspective of complete security. Uh, but if we take if we take the computer security paradigm, if you will, um, and look at it from a physical security perspective, we might consider that, well, it's perfect security is perhaps a pipe dream. It is a laudable goal, but realistically, we're never going to get there. You now, we've been building buildings for as long as humans have existed, and we still don't have a way of securing a building uh, without um, with zero risk of somebody finding a way in. So in this picture, we have an example of a castle. Um, so from the traditional cyber or the traditional computer security perspective, we might say, well, we put a firewall or a stone wall around our treasure chest or our critical information or whatever it is. And so we've stopped, let's say, the casual person from walking in or maybe someone who has a small ladder. Uh, but if we think about really the security behind a wall, in this case, there's lots of ways to get around a wall. You can dig under a wall. You can get a big ladder and climb over a wall. You can get a trebuchet and destroy the wall. You know, if you wait long enough, the wall falls apart. And so a wall, in terms of physical security, is not a perfect uh, security mechanism, but it's one that we accept generally as pretty good. Um, so, but what attack is trying to do is trying to capture not you know, the security, the different options for securing this treasure chest, but really trying to capture what are the different ways adversaries can bypass our wall. And once they're within the wall, what can they do? So that is really the purpose of attack. Uh, and we call this um, a threat informed defense. So rather than a defense based on a technology or a specific layer in the OSI model, uh, we're trying to figure out, okay, what are the things that average are trying to do to us? And what can we do about that? Uh, so attack is a knowledge base of adversary behaviors. Um, it is importantly based on real world observations. Uh, it's free, open, and globally accessible, unless your country blocks it, um, and is uh, community driven. So I think the first point uh, is self-explanatory. Um, the important part about the second bullet is that this is not stuff we came up with in a lab or things we made up or you know things we talked or we just pulled out of Black Hat or other security conferences, uh, most of the content in attack is based on reports that are put out by other organizations or people in the community that can show some demonstrated uh, use of these techniques so that we know, okay, this is a real live thing and not just a hypothetical use that somebody was able to do in a lab. Um, as I said, it's free and open, which means anybody can use it. Um, there's no license to use it. This is not a thing you buy. It's not a thing you install in a server room. It is, as I mentioned before, a framework, and more importantly, a framework of language uh, that we can use to talk between groups. And so yesterday in the plenary sessions, there was a lot of talk about how important it is that we all speak a common language that we all are on the same page about how we talk about cybersecurity or cybersecurity related topics. And so that is part of what it, the attack framework is trying to do is provide a way for not just the practitioners to discuss it, but how can the practitioners talk to their management 
or other organizations that maybe are not as technically deep as the practitioners are. You know, a manager may not know what a command prompt is, for example, but the practitioner knows. So how does the practitioner convert that into something that um, their management might understand? And then uh, I think the community point, we take input from throughout the community. So it's not just MITRE or you no know, United States organizations even, we take input from anyone in the world and you can email us or contact us uh, with ideas or proposals for changes or additions to the framework. And we'll take those into consideration and integrate them. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, this is David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain uh, that he published in around 2013. And the purpose of this was to capture how easy or difficult it is for adversaries to change various things we look for as network defenders. So traditionally, we'll look at a lot of things like hash values or IP addresses when we get cyber threat intelligence or other information about ongoing compromises. But the problem with those are, using those in defense at least, is they are trivial for adversaries to change. You know, to change the hash of a program just takes recompiling it or changing a single variable or editing one string. And then the hash is completely different. And now your detection or your mitigation for that is useless. And so as we go up this pyramid, uh, we see an increasingly harder and harder um, things or artifacts. Um, a lot of these are generally called IOCs in a case of compromise uh, that adversaries, it's increasingly difficult for adversaries to change them. So changing an IP address, also not that hard, maybe a little bit to find a publicly facing uh, IP address to change it. Uh, domain names, again, you can just register a new domain name, but it's a little more time. And eventually, uh, we get up to TTPs, or tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, and this is where attack comes in. So attack, uh, when we started doing attack, we saw this whole this problem with traditional network security, which is, yeah, we can write all the firewall rules, all the antivirus fi that files, all the whatevers, detect these, but these are easy for an adversary to change. And so as defenders, we are always lagging behind in defense. So it's always, we spend a lot of time trying to change our uh, detections or mitigations. And then it's trivial for the adversaries to subvert those, which means we're fighting a constant losing battle. Uh, but if we can get up to TTPs and addressing these, then we hope that that um, dynamic inverts and adversaries then had to spend a lot more time editing their TTPs while we have already prepared, hopefully, for those uh, eventualities. And so we don't have to spend as much time investing those. Also, this is a smaller space than all these. You know, there's an enormous number, possible theoretical number of hash values. You'll net, you can't write you know, a detection for all hash values. What you can do is perhaps identify all the TTPs or a small or a subset of those and address those. Uh, but within TTPs themselves, um, there's you no know, further breakdown. We have procedures, uh, sub techniques, um, and then techniques and then tactics above those. And we'll get more into how attack looks at each of these uh, later in the slides. Again, a little refresher, this is what it looks like. Um, these are all techniques down the bottom, uh, but above this graph, uh, we have different matrices and platforms. So uh, this one visualization does not encompass all possible techniques across all systems. You know, this is what we call attack enterprise, which is the most generalized one. Uh, we'll get mentioned a little bit later what is included, but we also have other platforms or matrices that apply to different platforms. Uh, so across, like I said, we have across the top of tactics. And then within each tactic, we have individual techniques and sub-techniques. 
And within each of those, we have, you know, things like a description of what that is or the sub techniques that make up that. Uh, and then coming out of that, we also have uh, mitigations and data sources we can use for detections. And further, we have the individual procedures for how those specific techniques and sub techniques are implemented. So you see within the frame, just the one framework itself, we can go from, you know, uh, what systems do I care about? Which tactics apply to those systems? Um, which techniques um, apply and how those might work? And then what can I do about it? Or what are some options I have to either detect or mitigate it? And so it's a lot of information we as network defenders need when trying to do our jobs. And it's also constantly growing. And in all these different aspects, uh, we're constantly making updates and changes. You know, tactics are generally pretty static, um, but the techniques and especially the sub techniques, um, they're always coming out with new ones or new details, uh, particularly when you talk about procedures or groups and software that use them. So let's visualize um, the relationships between these things uh, in case it wasn't clear from when I described them. So at the top left, we have the adversary group. Uh, this is a lot of times what we, we see in three-hour reports. So APT3, APT3X, or whatever, is doing something. Uh, but what are they doing? They're using uh, a lot of times a technique. And to do that technique, they're usually using software. They don't have to. But they oftentimes will have software that they use specifically which implements those techniques. And those techniques accomplish certain tactics. So you know, they're dumping credentials in order um, to, or they're dumping LSAS memory in order to get credentials. Uh, and then we as defenders have mitigation options which can prevent um, these techniques. So here's an example if we were filling those blanks. APT28 uses Mimikatz, a credential dumper, to do LSAS memory credential dumping. Uh, we can, that accomplishes credential access for the adversary, giving them access to user credentials. But we as network defenders can use credential access protection to help prevent that. Now, this is not uh, in a framework, we do not say it is a completely comprehensive uh, framework, there are certainly gaps uh, in there that we maybe don't know about. And so um, be careful about assuming, well, this is everything that could ever happen, because that's not true. This is more of a capturing of what has been publicly released um, in the community. And so when we're talking about visualizing attack, as I mentioned before, uh, we usually talk about in this tabular format. And this is a useful visualization uh, because it captures relationships between tactics, techniques, and sub-techniques. And each matrix we look at is centered around a specific technology domain. So in this example, we have, again, tactics across the top and then the techniques below them. And then, so you can easily see, okay, well, what does internal spear phishing accomplish? Well, it may help enable lateral movement. Uh, what does um, data for removal media, uh, in this case, you might think of things like CDs or USBs, um, do, or how might an adversary use those against me? Well, they can use it uh, to enable data collection. Maybe they pull data off of those devices and so on and so forth. And these are might vary between the different platforms. Uh, we'll get talk a little bit more what those are later, um, but just keep that in mind. And so in the, that sort of tabular format, you can see these as well. So in this case, technique A and technique B are unique to both tactics A and B respectively. However, uh, technique C is common across both tactics. Now, how can that be? How can a technique be common across both? Well, let's take the example of scheduled tasks. Uh, you can use scheduled tasks to either maintain persistence. So that might be something like scheduling a task to run when a system boots, or you can schedule a task to run as a different user like system, 
in which case that might be more representative of um, privilege escalation. And so that's why some techniques have these cross tactic boundaries because depending on how you implement it, it might have different techniques or I mean, I'm sorry, tactics. And then if we go a little further, technique D has no sub techniques, uh, but technique E, I uh, see it from the three little dashes, has uh, multiple sub techniques, which means it has different implementations. You'll see this uh, these occur especially with techniques that cross multiple platforms or multiple operating systems, because the way you accomplish something in Windows uh, might vary from how you do it in Linux or Mac. So we talked about what um, the different plat different operating systems are within enterprise. And so within the enterprise group, we have Windows, Linux, a Mac, cloud, and um, networking systems, so things like routers, uh, those sorts of devices. And in total, in the current, I believe, um, model or framework, we have 14 enterprise tactics. Uh, these are roughly, I would say very roughly, in order of how they might be pursued by an adversary, but that's not strictly speaking true. If you really look at it, you'll see uh, in an actual uh, event or campaign that these really cycle in on themselves a lot. You know, they'll do persistence, credential access, execution, lateral movement, and then do it all over again on a new system. Uh, but you know, things like reconnaissance are probably going to happen upfront. And things like exfiltration or impact are going to be towards the end generally. And so like I mentioned before, it's not just those um, common operating systems devices. We also have other domains we talked about. And so they may target lots of different technologies. And as we know, I'll know, especially like the thing like Internet of Things, there's a very wide breadth of possible things we have to care about not just the traditional enterprise network. And so we have actually mobile attack as well. And this enca encapsulates Android and iOS um, techniques or at least techniques that work across those devices. And so because those are very different technologies from what you have in your normal enterprise network, we have a separate um, grouping of techniques and tactics for those. And similarly, we have an attack for ICS or industrial control systems and SCADA, because those are very different systems, uh, but we still care about them, especially when we start talking about national critical infrastructure, or you know, these are things like power plants or ports or airports, you know, things that if something happens to them, you know, it could be catastrophic. You know, if somebody compromises a dam on a river and releases the floodgates, that can be catastrophic for anybody living downriver. Uh, but these platforms don't exist independently of each other. Um, there's overlaps and redundancies that exist between all the matrices because a lot of the tactics in particular, but some of the techniques as well are common across them. And it's also important to identify where these overlaps are because there's a lot of overlap in these different platforms. So going back a slide, we look at you know, enterprise versus mobile versus attack ICS. You could have a network that has all three things in it. You know, your core of your network might be Windows. You might have servers in the back end that are running Linux. You might have users connecting their mobile devices to that network, either in the office or maybe you have staff out in the field doing things through their mobile devices that are work-related, like checking pipelines or whatever. Uh, but your network may also have an ICS SCADA section. And oftentimes the ICS SCADA in particular is forgotten because some of the systems are so archaic that we as network defense don't even know how to begin to start looking at it. You know, it's just numbers transited across a wire uh, without any idea what that means. But the impact of being compromised there can be just as large as anywhere else in the network. 
And so going a little more detail about the different sections of attack, uh, tactics are the adversary goals during an attack, or that's uh, one way to think about it. It's the why of why an adversary performs each action or does that specific technique. And so the list of tactics may vary across different technology domains, but generally speaking, they're relatively static. There's a later side where I look at how attack has evolved over time, um, but up front here, we've roughly, in seven or so years, we've only roughly doubled the number of tactics. Uh, the number of techniques is growing much larger than that. Uh, each tactic is assigned an ID, as well as a short and long description. So uh, when you read threat reports, you might see things referenced like tactic numbers, which are the TA number. Uh, and then each of these, of course, have a name. And then in a summary view, it has a description. But if we open up each of those tactics, we have much more detailed information. In this case, for persistence, you know, the summary is the adversary is trying to gain or to maintain their foothold. Uh, but the longer one is persistence consists of techniques that adversaries use to keep access to systems across restarts, change credentials, et cetera, et cetera. The great de the detail is very important for us as defenders to know and understand. So we're better prepared to understand what we're looking for. So again, the top is tactics. Uh, within, let's take the lateral movement tactic. Uh, these are a group of the different means of lateral movement within um, the model. So we have things like remote services, software deployment tools, replication through removal, removal media like USBs, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then, as I mentioned before, these this, uh, hamburger icon or triple hash, whatever you want to call it, in a case there are sub techniques within each of those. And so if you go into dive into one of those, in this case, the command um, and scripting interpreter technique, the techniques are the means by which adversaries achieve their tactical goals uh, from the adversary's perspective, not the defenders. So this is the how of uh, adversary performing each action. Uh, the list of techniques may differ across platforms, uh, but they do grow and evolve over time and often unlike the tactics groups. So in this case, we have the command and scripting interpreter, which in this case has eight sub techniques and then has this as its general description of that technique. And so each of these blue links goes to a different section on um, the attack site with information about you know, what is command, Windows command shell, what is JavaScript or J scripts. And so when we're trying to redo research as defenders, attack provides us a good resource for better understanding what the adversary is doing. If you go, uh, like I mentioned before, we have the sub techniques, and these are more specific descriptions of the adversarial behavior used to achieve the goal. So in the case of command and scripting interpreter, we have different command and scripting interpreters. Um, they describe the behavior at a lower level than a technique, um, but sub techniques have only a single technique parent. So you don't have a many-to-many -many relationship between uh, techniques and sub-techniques. Sub-techniques are always tied to a single technique. Uh, they are often, but not always, platform-specific. And so this is where I mentioned the different operating systems, for example. You might have a way of doing uh, um, executing a script on Windows that doesn't apply to Linux. And these are designed to help reduce changes to the techniques as new variations and platforms are added. So these are intended to be very um, fluctuating. They know we might add them, we might consolidate them, we might break them apart based on uh, information that comes out. So if you look at the sub techniques for the command and scripting interpreter, um, here's a list. And you see they have a T number uh, and then the syntax is generally the T number and then a sequential number. Um, and so talking about why these are separated, PowerShell only applies to Windows. AppleScript only applies to iOS devices, and et cetera, et cetera. So if, as a defender, someone came to me and said, well, they're doing command and scripting interpreter on systems. 
I wouldn't know what to look for. But the deeper, I'm sorry, can you please minimize the screen? I'm not sure which screen you are referring to. Your screen looks good to me. Okay. Um, sorry, I uh, lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so yeah, these are oftentimes going to be specific to different operating systems. And as I mentioned, the nomenclature is, uh, they have to be unique, otherwise we can't talk about them in a common way. Uh, uh, so the techniques are labeled with T and then a four digit number. And the sub techniques have the format of that technique number dot their uh, sub technique number, which is an incrementing value. Um, theoretically, we could get to a thousand, we'd have a problem, uh, but so far we're nowhere near there. And so for the brute force ID tech, uh, tech, technique, I'm sorry, no, sorry, tech, yeah, technique, um, ID, T1110, um, we have four different sub techniques and, and those are labeled one, two, three, four, and they have different names. And you can deep dive each of these to learn more. But that's not the only thing that's in uh, techniques. Uh, they include a wealth of additional information that connects us to the rest of the attack model. It includes, like I mentioned, mitigations. So how can I prevent that technique from occurring? Uh, data sources. So what data sources can I use to detect that technique and what detection methods might I use to identify it? Uh, what procedures are used? So this would be starting bridge that gap between TTPs and IOCs. So this is very specific implementations of how each technique is being done. So in this case, we have APT41 um, doing, um, executing file bin password and exploiting this specific CVE against Citrix devices. So this is a very, very specific uh, implementation of a technique. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the technique page as a whole, oh, I believe this, uh, this is a sub technique, I'm sorry. Um, it contains all of that information in a pretty consolidated view. So we have um, the high level description. We have some of the um, summarized information about it in tags, things like contributors on are included in here as well. Uh, we have specific procedure examples. So we talked about the mitigations and the detections. So for the mitigations, in this case, um, on the operating system configuration, uh, you might be able to ensure only that uh, password filters are registered. In this case, we're talking about password filter DLL usage. We're getting credentials. Uh, so mitigations are configurations, tools, or processes that can prevent a technique from working or having the desired outcome for an adversary. Uh, they're intended to allow you to take an action such as changing a policy or deploying a tool for the purpose of stopping those adversaries. And so the big distinction here is mitigations help stop activity detections, help you identify when activity occurs generally. You could use detections to then implement mitigations. Uh, that's a little beyond the scope of this uh, course. So um, this is all a, pop a populated example from a technique page of different mitigations. So from an antivirus or anti-malware perspective, you can use it to automatically quarantine suspicious files. You might, from a code signing perspective, if you have code signing soft, software that checks for code signing or things like that, you only permit execution of signed scripts versus unsigned and so on and so forth. So you might look at this and like, okay, we, we do have antivirus. So let's figure out how we can solve this problem through antivirus or anti-malware. Or no, we have that, but it's not working. So what else can we do? Maybe we can stop its execution or we, maybe we need to better manage our privilege account usage. And so you can use this and start looking at different options for mitigating. In the case of example, remove a feature program. Uh, we can dive into that and then has you know, some information about how to do that. And so we dive down all the way from a tactic to a technique, to a sub-technique, 
to a mitigation to a very concrete thing you can do about that, which I think is very powerful. And it is all done in the same framework. And then within those each mitigation, you also have, well, what else does that mitigation apply to? So this specific mitigation doesn't necessarily just apply to that one technique. It might apply to many techniques. And so you, now you're starting to come all the way back out out of the mitigation, like, okay, well, if I do this, what else is it possibly going to affect? And so you might, when you're prioritizing mitigations, look at, okay, which mitigation does the most for me? Now, which one addresses the most techniques or sub-techniques? So looking at data sources uh, and detection. So the data sources really will often inform the detection. The data sources help inform how you do that detection. Um, historically, in past, past versions of attack, uh, data sources look more like this. They're very high level descriptions of things you might look for. Uh, but in more recent release, releases since last year, I believe, uh, we started to expand it to be much more granular. Uh, so we as defenders have a better idea of what we're really trying to look for. So in this case is we're looking at things like file file creation events. So what are the things you can do with files? Well, you can create them. So we're going to look for file creation specifically versus things like file modifications or file deletions. And so data sources are sources of information collected by a sensor or logging system. So oftentimes this is what you'll see when you're looking in a seam or doing perhaps forensics is you're collecting data sources uh, for, for data to then turn that into information about what the adversary was doing. Uh, so use that, like I said, to collect information relevant to identifying adversary actions. And this is the where to collect data. And as of attack version nine, uh, as I was just talking about, data sources also include data components to further define data requirements. So we're not saying things like process anymore. We're talking about process creation. Um, and then we can tie process creation to specific data sources like Sysmon. So, okay, so if I want to collect, I need to collect process creation events for this technique. How can I do that? Well, I can do a Sysmon event code one. And now I have a whole chain of who, what threats people are doing, how they're doing it, what can I use to detect it? and then actually getting to implementing that on a system. And this is uh, the GitHub repository where that information is stored. And so you can see here sort of that connection that I was just talking about. So for this specific sub-technique of credential dumping via LSAS memory, there's three different ways uh, we can look at that from a process perspective. And this is why we had to break it out. You can do it from a process access level, you can do it from a process operating system API execution level or a process creation level. So from a process creation level, you might be looking at, they ran Mimi cats. Uh, from the process access, you might be looking at, well, which processes are actually accessing that memory space? And then API execution, which APIs are actually being executed as part of that process? So, well, how, how we get to use those data sources for actually building detections. Um, oftentimes, we're, when we're talking about this, we're talking about analytics. So high-level analytic processes, sensors, data, and detection strategies. Analytics are just a part of that. Uh, they're useful to identify a technique that has been used by an adversary. So this is how to interpret the collected data. So, okay, we're sucking in all this information, but then what do we do with it? You know, just having it doesn't get us anywhere. So if we take the example of um, the LSAS memory access, we have lots of data sources and we have a lot of different detection options, but then how are they tied together? So um, this, this command, command execution really addresses this or can be used for this specific detection. Process creation is this one. And then the OS, OS API execution and process access is sort of found up here. So um, reading these, you can sort of start seeing how they're all tied together. So it's not just, well, go look at process creation, but what are you, what are you looking for in process creation? In this case, Mimi, looking at things like Mimi cats. 
or other uh, remote tools, remote access tools that you know use it. Then diving into procedure examples. Um, these are going to be things like uh, groups or tools that use it. So procedures are specific implementations the adversary uses for techniques or sub-techniques. And these are populated on a technique pages as well as groups and um, the software pages. And they describe the group or software entities with a brief description of how that technique is used. So we have here things like APT38 is using, that uses the Hermes ransomware to encrypt files with AES26, which is different than maybe what JCry does, which is they encrypt files and demand Bitcoin to decrypt those files. And so that's why we have to have different um, implementations or procedures for how different adversaries use different techniques because they're not going to always be the same. So let's take APT38 as an example, which is a group. Groups are related intrusion activity that are tracked by a common name. Uh, and some groups have multiple names associated with similar activities. So in the case of APT1, uh, APT1 is a Chinese threat group that has been attributed to the second bureau of the uh, PLA, General Staff Department's third department, commonly known as the military unit cover designator as unit 61398. Um, they also have other names. Uh, such as common crew, common group, common panda, et cetera. Now, the challenge here is that different cyber threat intelligence providers have different names and they have different ways of organizing groups. And so with an attack, we do our best to try and consolidate them into what we think is the best fit. But there's some debate about you know, where the lines between different groups are. Uh, but these are all, these are not going to be based on sort of our name. These are going to be based on what the community thinks uh, their naming scheme is. And then the alternative to that, as we've talked about, is the software or the tools or malware used by an adversary during intrusions. And again, uh, some entries might have multiple names. So PlugX, which is a rat, may also go by Destroy Rat, Sogu, Kaba, or Core Plug, perhaps depending on which um, threat group uses it. And we try to capture that as well. Uh, so we take APT38, an example, which has been attributed to North Korea. Uh, this is their high level description of what they are. These are the techniques they all they use. This is the software they're known to use along with the techniques that software is known to implement. So we have a lot of information just for that one group uh, on their page, too much to fit on one side. So that's the, the high level description of all the contents of attack. Uh, so, but attack is a living framework. So what I just went over is subject to change. So adversaries, malware and behaviors evolve every day. Uh, techniques, groups and software are designed to be added, deleted or enhanced as needed. So we built the framework to be flexible uh, to what the current state of things are in our community. Uh, but we need a process for vetting and modifying content. Um, we can't just open it up to everybody and say, add whatever you want, because it would just be chaos. Not to mention people possibly trying to spoil it or ruin uh, the framework for other people. So we are the curators of the framework. Although we, like I said before, we take community contributions. Um, and we don't want to include just everything that may theoretically be possible. We want to keep it grounded in what people are actually seeing. And so that's why uh, we want to keep it grounded in real adversary usage. So talk a little about the history of how it's evolved and changed. Uh, this is what it looked like in the first release back in around 2014. You see there's only eight techniques versus the 14 now and significantly less uh, techniques. You know, it all used, it fits re legibly on one slide, which was nice at the time. But as research has continued and as our awareness of techniques has changed, uh, we've greatly expanded um, the model. And so now we're here. And you see that's significantly larger. And we hope that. Um, this is better addresses this TTP 
part of the pyramid. Whereas before we had some things were, were very specific, like at, um, this is now it's called schedule tasks, uh, which encapsulates different specific procedures or implementations of that technique. And so you can see a schedule task up here, which now crosses three tactics groups as well. So that kind of shows you the way the model has evolved over time. So how do we track all these changes? Um, and how often do we do it? Uh, so roughly we have a biannual schedule. It's not a hard schedule. It's not like we have to release it on a specific certain day, but we aim for around twice a year. Um, the attack website is structured in sticks or the structured threat information expression. Um, unfortunately, the attack defend framework is outside the scope of um, this course. Um, I believe there is, I'm trying to remember if there, there's course released on under MAD as well, um, but we do have other trainings available we do for attack defender, I believe. And they, yes, the size will be shared later. Um, so Styx is a, also another framework we use for sharing uh, information or um, threat information between groups. So it provides a way for different organizations to share a computer understandable interpretation of things like compromises or campaigns. And we also keep the update logs on the website as well. So you can see what changes between different releases. So you see here an example from last year, uh, what changed in version eight and sort of what its state was, 14 tactics, 177 techniques, 348 sub techniques. And so this is what the uh, tracking looks like across the different versions. Uh, the very old versions, uh, version one and two, uh, are not in the sticks format, unfortunately. They were originally done in MediaWiki, and so they are not uh, preserved on the site. Uh, but how do we contribute to attack? Uh, so as you may, remember, may have noticed on the technique screen, we had a list of the contributors uh, that helped uh, with that technique or the tactic or tool, whatever. Uh, we try our best to keep up uh, ourselves, but if it's too much uh, for us to do uh, alone. Uh, we were not that big a team, re really. Uh, so we rely on the community to help give us information and provide um, feedback. Uh, so at that link, we have how you can, some guidance for how you can contribute if you want to, and some examples. And we credit you, um, unless you specifically ask not to be credited, and perhaps you don't feel comfortable uh, with your name being on the site, that's okay. We don't have to include you. Uh, but feel free to email us at attack.miter.org if you have an idea. Uh, some more links. Uh, here is the attack website. It's attack.miter.org. Um, we also have a couple of documents capturing the philosophy behind attack and how to get started. Uh, and those are here as well. Uh, so with that, we've been going for about an hour. So I would say we can take a seven minute break and reconvene. At, um... Okay, so we're gonna move into section two now, which is the benefits of using attack. So by now we should have a pretty good idea of what attack is, you know, what it looks like, what are the parts and pieces, how they fit together. Uh, so now we're gonna start talking about how to actually start using it or why we wanna use it. So uh, again, this is a, what, sort of the same view you've seen before, but a little bit different. So now we have, um, if we're operating a different team, we have different people in the team and we have you know, maybe different ways of noting things down on the framework, uh, but how does that help us? So um, in this case, we have boot or long auto start execution and those sub techniques. Uh, but we, as the cyber threat intelligence team, say something like, this is what the adversary is doing. Um, and they're using the run key uh, is Adobe Updater. And then us as the cyber defense team or the you know, network defenders or SOC analysts, whatever your role or position is, they, oh, we have registry data. We can look for that. 
And so this one entry in attack can be shared between those two teams as a common language. And so that's why this is such a beneficial thing. And doesn't just extend to CTI and SOC analysts, but also other teams and groups associated with the cybersecurity. So attack is, is mentioned, a team effort and the framework is cleverly built from publicly available reporting and documentation. Uh, so that can be from CTI analysts or from uh, defenders. So you might have CTI analysts contribute more towards the usage of techniques and you might have uh, SOC analysts or people in certs talking more or contributing more like, okay, I know I can look for this sort of technique in this kind of data. And everybody provides different insights and feedback. Um, and ideally, those are all citable contributions from the global communities and not just something someone came up with or made up. And again, we curate and maintain uh, all that knowledge. Uh, so what does this end up looking like in attack? Uh, so again, this is a group, um, but you also might have noticed these footnotes at the end of paragraphs or sections. And these are the different references that point to actual uh, cyber threat intelligence or threat reports that are out there in the public domain. So in this case with Turla, we didn't just make up that Turla is a Russian-based threat group that has affected victims in over 45 countries. We got that from, you know, this um, this article or no, this article or this report from CrowdStrike or this other um, threat report. And so this is all stuff put out there in the public domain and we're just consolidating it into one place. And so you can talk with some more confidence about, you know, yeah, Turla is a Russian-based threat group based on, you know, X number of different companies or people doing independent analyses and coming up to the same conclusion. Again, the procedures are also grounded in threat intelligence. You know, here we have uh, this specific um, usage by a PowerShell by Turla that uses maintaining persistence on affected machines. And that's tied directly back to this report um, from M. Fau and R. Dumont. So you can, yeah, an attack is nice to look at at a summary view, but if you really want to get into the weeds of how we got there, all the information is sourced to the open source materials. Of course, it's possible that you know, these articles go offline or taken down, whatever. Uh, in that case, please let us know if that happens so we can update the site so we don't have outdated uh, links. If you dive down even deeper, uh, to that uh, specific PDF, um, this might be an actual excerpt. So now we're down to, okay, this is actually what was the code used for that specific uh, technique. You know? And then you could actually directly do this yourself at home. Maybe not a good idea in this case, but you could. Uh, so you can say, okay, well, I can tell by looking at this, oh, they're doing encoded uh, PowerShell from a base 64 string, and this is this. You could um, decode that to get it out yourself and find out what it is and see, oh, yeah, no, it is in fact uh, encoded PowerShell. Uh, these are a listing of some of the different people who have contributed to uh, attack over the years. This is not comprehensive. So if you happen to be on the call and are somebody who's contributed already and you're not on here, sorry, but we don't, there's only so much room on the slide. Uh, my name is also not on here, so don't feel bad. But you see, there's lots of people from lots of different groups, and they're not just, as I mentioned, for US or even Europe. You know, and they're not even always people. You know, we have Elastic uh, from Elk or different people from Splunk or, um, uh, ESET or Palo Alto or Carbon Black or IBM. You know, these are big names in the security world. They're all contributing uh, to attack. And in many cases, implementing attack within their own companies. And that gives us, like I talked before, 
but that diverse perspective. And that gives a lot of breadth of ideas and operational applications for how different techniques can be done or are being done by adversaries. And so we might take, for example, well, we don't know anything about supply chain compromise, but maybe you are working in an investigation where that happened and you can provide some in input on you know, which techniques were used for that. You know, we may not be aware of unused or unsupported cloud regions in other parts of the world. And so you can maybe provide input based on those. Or maybe we don't know uh, specific uh, information about a particular device or machine and ICS systems. And so you can help give us or share that information with the community as a whole so that others who might have to go do you know, and it resolve an incident at a power plant or a dam or whatever, it's like, oh, they have information on what that device's communications are or how an adversary might use that on attack. So now I know what to look for there. Then also, you know, we may not know much about um, carrier billing fraud, but maybe the companies like Android or Apple do, and maybe they can provide input on some of the techniques they see um, on their end for that sort of fraud. And so maybe defenders can go back and improve the security of those devices uh, using that information. But we can't be experts in everything. And that's why we need the input from the community to help us make attack, the attack framework as comprehensive as it can be. As I said, cybersecurity is complex and we can't know everything. Uh, there's lots of technologies, lots of processes, and lots of people that all need to work together and those people, processes, and technology are constantly changing. And those people need different levels of details and formats of information. You know, the SOC analyst needs, you know, perhaps very detailed information, whereas the manager doesn't. Or, or the person writing the threat report needs uh, some other kind of information to make a report that reads well. You know, nobody wants to read 20 lines of code. They want someone to distill that into something that means something. And so we need the collaboration communication across the resources. And that's key uh, to enabling all these teams to work together and different organizations. And as we talked, uh, touched on earlier, attacks provides that adversary language. That's critical for consistently sharing ideas about adversary behaviors. It's abstracted to an operational level, but also detailed enough that you can talk at a very low level, but also talk at you know, the tactics level you know, we are seeing, you know, your manager, manager may only care about, well, they're moving laterally in the network and he knows what that means, but he doesn't need to know necessarily. Well, they're using SMB shares to copy files over before remotely scheduling tasks, execute those files. That's maybe too much information for him. He just needs to know they're moving laterally. Uh, and this also uh, connects the adversary perspective uh, to the defensive perspective. So in a lot of times, a lot of events I've been to, you know, the red team or the adversary will say, well, we did X, Y, Z, but as a defender, that doesn't mean anything. You know, or it's so generic that there's no way I don't know what to do with it in terms of finding it. Like, and then we moved to computer X and then did, we ran our rat. Well, as a defender, I don't know what the rat's name is. I don't know how it works. I don't know anything about it. Um, so the only thing I could get out of that is maybe looking for some sort of lateral movement and then maybe finding, you know, some executable that occurred after that, but it's super vague. But if you talk about things like, well, we used SMB shares to copy our rat tool. Uh, and then we had that thing do these five techniques. Like, oh, okay. I know what to kind of look for now. So next time if you go back and do another event, we should be better prepared uh, for things I might've missed before. And so traditionally, this is what the sort of communication looks like between CTI, red teams, and SOC analysts. Now CTIs will say things like, uh, we are seeing adversaries run this command, uh, in this case, secure LSA logon passwords. So that's what we call more like an IOC. You know, it's a string to look for in data. And your red team might say, oh, I kind of know what that is. I think that belongs to Mimi Cats. And then your side guys are, okay, well, Mimi Cats, I can research Mimi Cats and I can write syntax 
uh, for that. So I'll just look for like secure LSA logon passwords that that will mean Mimikatz would run the environment. And we'll call that the analytic. The problem with that is there is that is there's a lack of context and details communicated across those groups. And that leads to operational shortcomings. So really this sort of string search kind of thing is very tool specific. It may, you may even call it a host artifact because it's just a string that occurs on a command line. So it's not really getting to the hard problem of TTPs. And so what could somebody do? Well, an adversary could run Mimikatz not on a command line, or they could not use that uh, argument, or they could recompile it and edit the code to be secure LSA2 colon colon logon passwords. And now your analytic is broken. So that's why it's very fragile. So how does attack, sorry, if you cannot uh, see it under uh, this, I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, under attack, you can say stuff like, well, they're using OS credential dumping using LSAS memory. And so from CTI side, that looks more like, this is a very common trade crouch across many groups and software. So we're seeing this technique across a lot of things. So maybe it's a high priority for us. And the rest is like, okay, I, for that specific technique, I know what they're doing is they're reading LSAS memory space. And as a defender, that shifts the defense creation or the, the analytic from being about this string to being, okay, well, I need to monitor process access to LSAS, which is a, in this case, an actual technique to look for because no, and as much broader, much more broadly applicable because no longer are we looking for this one string. They can name the string whatever they want. They can name Mimikatz whatever they want. It's still reading LSAS memory access. It's still gonna to have to do this. So this would be a much more robust detection in the long term for finding this behavior or this behavior. But how do we measure our cybersecurity? Um, it's unfortunately not easy to quantify, um, but it's vital to track progress and growth over time. You know, metrics like we have 100 analytics doesn't really mean anything. It means you hopefully are better at detecting things, but across what the average is doing, it may mean nothing. Uh, so let's look at an uh, example scorecard. Um, so here uh, we've scored what techniques are most important to us. Uh, however, we came up with this. So this could be our threat analyst, like, okay, these are the X number most common techniques, or you know, these are the ones that we care mo are most applicable to our environment, maybe. Uh, and then we can also map, okay, what techniques do we have defenses even for? So there's some overlap in some of these, like phishing. So we care about it. And we have a defense for it, but other ones, we don't have uh, any things in the, that exist to address them. And so we can use that to inform our decision-making. We can identify where do we need to improve? Uh, where are gaps in our current knowledge versus where we want to be? And in this case, that might be these four things. And so now we've narrowed down from this whole, you know, two, what, 200, 200 plus, uh, techniques to four that we need to address. And that's a much more tractable number. Like, okay, now we start planning. How do we address these four? Now, let's start with valid accounts. How do we address valid accounts? What is valid accounts? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what are some other potential, potential, potential metrics to measure? Uh, we can use a similar approach to quantify other aspects of data captured and attack, like data sources, uh, detections and analytics, uh, mitigations controls, and really anything you can come up with. So uh, one thing I do a lot of is I will map individual tools to attack. And so then I can build a, ma a map of, okay, this tool addresses these techniques, this tool addresses these techniques, this tool addresses these techniques. Now, if I can, I can overlay those all together, and now I see for my enterprise, all the techniques that have tools that at least generate data for them. 
And you could do the same thing with your analytics. You could do the same thing perhaps with your CTI. So, okay, which uh, techniques do we have cyber threat intelligence for? Which ones maybe don't we need, we need, we need not to care about because there's nothing saying that's even being used. But how do we make these graphs? Um, so this is a little subjective, uh, but we do have a tool we provide to help you do this. And that is the attack navigator. And that what allows us to do is to give you uh, this uh, tabular format of the attack framework. It allows you to do things like colorize cells, score them, layer them on top of each other, group them. So it's a very handy tool in order to start using the framework without having to resort to Excel, things like Excel spreadsheets. So the attack navigator is designed to provide basic navigation and annotation of attack matrices. Uh, it helps you visualize your defensive coverage, your red blue team planning, uh, the frequency of detected techniques or anything else you want to do. So maybe after you do a red blue team exercise, you map what the red team saw and what the blue team saw and that, and then look where the gaps are. Or uh, you just look at, well, how many times did the red team do X technique versus another? And you can manipulate the cells in the matrix with a variety of ways, including color coding, adding a comment, assigning a numerical value, et cetera. And on top of each matrix, we have this concept of layers. And these are uh, custom views of the attack matrix. Uh, and they can be created interactively with the navigator or programmatically using JSON. And you can import them yourself or export them to share with others or to load them into different instances. Uh, so how do you get there? Uh, the source code and documentation are all available on GitHub at that link. And it's also hosted at this GitHub link. Um, so you can download it yourself. You can use the publicly accessible version that's already out there. It's all free for you to use however you want. And this is what it looks like. And so it looks very similar to the other visualizations of attack we've already looked at. So we have you know, the tactics, uh, the techniques, uh, we have the sub techniques, uh, but we also have uh, the sort of toolbar. So what is in that toolbar? Uh, we have selection controls, layer controls, and technique controls. And these are the different ways we can manipulate the chart. So this is the sort of the group button. And this allows you to select or deselect techniques based on groups, software, or mitigations. And so you can do things like just open the attack network and say, okay, tell me what techniques APT16 uses, select. And it will select all those techniques. And you do that for software, or other, any other group. And you can select multiple groups as well. So that's a very easy tool instead of, okay, going to attack site, going through the list of te um, techniques, trying to map them manually one by one at a time. It's very labor intensive, but this, at least using the pre-generated ones, is, makes it very easy. Once you've done that, you can then do things like add colors, uh, which is what we've done in the past charts or add scoring, uh, so you can assign numbers, or add comments like, you know, we detect this 50% of the time using tool X. And maybe you use a layer of the navigator to track you know, how you detect different techniques. Uh, and then finally, once you have it sort of set, you can export it in a variety of methods using like JSON, Excel, or SVG, if you just want the picture. So it gives you a lot of flexibility and options to make it easy to work with the framework itself. So with layers, um, when you create, when you open up the navigator, this is the page you usually end up with. And this allows where you do those sort of working with layers. And so when you create a new layer, uh, you're presented with the option of which um, platform you want to use. Uh, oftentimes it's enterprise, but also we have mobile and ICS on there. If you want to load one, uh, you do it here. And if you want to create a layer that is a composite of multiple layers, uh, you do that here. Uh, if we have time at the end, um, I'll run through that, what that looks like. But it basically, uh, you can do a sort of an end operation or math operations on the layers themselves 
to get some like summaries. So you might say like layer one, anything in layer one is assigned a value one. Anything in layer two is assigned a value of two. And then layer three is a summary of those. And so if the value in the third layer is three, that means it was common across both. You can do that sort of thing. Uh, so let's go move into our third and final section, which is operationalizing attack. So when we talk about using attack in operations, uh, we also talk about in the mindset of three use cases, that is cyber threat intelligence, uh, detections and analytics, threat emulation, and assessments and engineering. And all of these are working together with a purpose of doing a threat or enabling a threat informed defense. And we define that as the systematic application of a deep understanding of adversary tradecraft and technology to prevent, detect, and or respond to cyber attacks. So let's start with CTI. Uh, so cyber threat intelligence or CTI is all about knowing what your adversaries do. Uh, so it's critical for improving decision-making as well as shaping operations, uh, especially in the context of threat and forward defense. So what we often, or I often see people do in SOCs or when they're responding to incidents is the first thing they'll say is, what data do we have? And then they'll start trying to solve a problem out of that data. Um, what we're saying here is you should start rather with what am I even, what techniques or adversaries I'm even looking for? And does that data I have support that? Or do I need additional data to find that? You know, it doesn't, if you're looking for a technique that doesn't use, that has nothing to do with, let's say, PCAP, then you don't need to go and push uh, somebody start collecting PCAP off their network devices. You're just wasting time because it's not going to help you achieve your goal of identifying that technique. So attack is a great starting point for identifying what behaviors have been reported for specific groups or malware. Uh, so we've talked a lot about that in terms of groups. So like threat group 3390 is a Chinese threat group, et cetera, et cetera. And on the attack layer, that threat group looks like this. You know, they do all these different techniques uh, with these different sub techniques. And then this is how they use it. And so that allows the threat intelligence people to communicate information in a way that is useful to defenders. So as a defender, I know what to look for, or how to look for net user, for example. Or I know um, they how to look for PowerShell execution. But if they just say stuff like, they do uh, elevation, they abuse elevation control mechanisms. I don't know what to do with that. Um, so a lot of times I've heard the issue of the people providing the threat information are not providing information in a way that is useful to the defenders. You know, they're, a lot of times they might be providing IOCs, uh, which are not really addressing that pyramid of pain problem that defenders uh, want to start addressing. And CTI comes in many forms. Uh, so we might have threat reports uh, like this one from CrowdStrike on their blog. Or you might have this snippet um, from a different threat report. Or you might even have someone sending something out over Twitter, which is just a snippet of code. And so cyber threat um, analysts have to keep an open mind about the different places they can pull this information from. It's not just uh, if you're a government agency, you know, your intelligence group, or if you're a company, you know, what, if you have a different threat intelligence group within the company, whatever they say, or what attacks you're seeing, you know, there's a whole community out there generating information for you to use. And a lot of it is open for you to use. So take advantage of it. But if we take some of the examples of cyber threat intelligence, how do we start deriving that into attack? So uh, in this example, we might see uh, these techniques out of this threat report. Uh, we have a different course if you want to learn more about cyber threat intelligence and how to derive stuff out of it on um, the MAD training page. 
Um, but it's you now a separate hour plus long course. So I don't have time to go into the nitty gritty details, unfortunately. Uh, so, and then from this sort of code segment, our script, uh, we might we extract these four other techniques. And then this tweet, um, tweet mentions these other ones. And so now we're starting to build a bigger picture of different techniques that are being used that we can give to the SOC analysts or the CSER members who are responsible for building detections and mitigations to what to look for. So instead of looking for everything, focus on this, I don't know, 20, let's call it. So what do we do with it? Um, going back to our LSAS memory credential or credential dumping LSAS memory example, um, we can see, well, Mimikatz is pretty common across all, as a pretty common tool to implement all of those. So maybe as a defender or threat analyst, whoever's responsible for this part, might want to spend some time investigating how Mimikatz works. Um, and going back to what we talked about before, the pyramid of pain, looking for things like the hash value or what a hash value for Mimikatz is not useful. Um, looking at their C2 that might use or the rats that might use that is also not helpful because the domain names that, that those text might be coming from is also very volatile. So we wanna think about what does Mimikatz actually do? You know, how does it change LSAS memory or, mod, or read LSAS memory? And what can we as offenders do to start looking for that? And this is what we start talking about behavioral-based analytics. So we're not talking about analytics based on IP addresses or hash values or domain names. We're talking about how, what is it that is inherent to that technique or behavior that we can look for that is more broadly applicable. So looking at that LSAS memory uh, example again, no, we can monitor for unexpected processes at interacting with LSAS.exe. Um, and then, okay, so how, what does that look like? Is there any other resources we have for that? And in the, this case, uh, we've actually done some work there. Uh, we have something called CAR, which is a cyber analytics repository, which has, which is a database or really it's a wiki of uh, different analytics tied to different uh, techniques. And so you can do things like, okay, well, how can, what analytics address Mimikatz or address this specific technique? And then, oh, we, are, we have this analytic out there that addresses that. And so this analytic specifically addresses memory dumping via Mimikatz. Uh, so credential dumpers like Mimikatz can be loaded into memory and from there read data from, uh, and other processes. Uh, this and looks for instances where processes are requesting specific permissions to read parts of the LSAS process in order to detect when credential dumping is occurring. Uh, there is a weakness, uh, which is that all current implementations are, are uh, overtuned to look for common access patterns associated with by Mimikatz. So there's still some weakness in this, but it is better than looking at just process creation and the Mimikatz string or specific arguments. And so in this case, this is like for any process uh, that will access specifically LSAS memory. Uh, for those not familiar, this is the sysmod event code for process access. Uh, and these are values that you find in the granted access field of those events. Uh, more specifically, these are an ending of the different flags associated when a process asks for permission to access another process's memory space. And so when Mimikatz uses a specific set of flags, usually, to do that. And so that's what this analytic is keying on. Now, this is also why this is um, fragile, because then someone who knows you're looking for that can change the flags being used and subvert this analytic. But at least it's better than what we had before. And again, it's looking for specific at LSAS, not just every process. But then, okay, now we've got an analytic that's based on some concrete cyber threat intelligence. Um, how do we validate that the analytic works? Uh, so oftentimes, or historically, um, red teams have sort of fulfilled this role. Uh, red teams mimic uh, known threats, and they allow us to operationalize intelligence uh, using the scope and prioritize what threats and behavior we test. Uh, they observe and evaluate our defenses 
uh, from the perspective of our adversaries. So um, there's different ways these can occur. Uh, the most basic one is a red team comes in, they do attacks, and then they leave and provide a report on what was what worked and what didn't. And so help inform the defense what they need to improve. Uh, as I mentioned before, traditional red teams perhaps do not communicate this in an effective way. And using attack can help them not only communicate their findings, but also help them plan um, their side of events better. So this example, um, you know, there's different ways of doing this specific technique. There's one, two, many, as we saw before. And we were hoping that this addresses all the tech, the different ways uh, that this specific technique can be done. But the reality might not be that. We might not, we may have use cases or edge cases that we did not account for. So I mean, we kind of look at uh, other cyber threat and tell us, okay, how else are people doing uh, this specific technique that maybe the blue team missed? And make sure we try to incorporate that into our plan when we're trying to average or emulate an adversary. So we want to ask ourselves, okay, if an adversary is going to do it this way, let's make sure we replicate the activity that way in our network to say, as so we can answer the question, are we safe? And so we have uh, the program called MITRE ATTACK Evaluations, which tries to do this for you. I mean, at least in some limited capacity, you can't do everything. Uh, but we try to look at different um, programs, different vendor products, and okay, look at which sort of techniques might be done and run it against those tools so we can say with some degree of certainty, yes, this vendor's product will detect that or no, it won't. And these are done in collaboration with those vendors. So here we have like on step 14 of the emulation plan, um, here's a high uh, level overview of the emulation techniques evaluated. Um, here's a cyber threat intelligence that we're gonna reference for that. Um, here are the contributors to that. And then here's sort of a verbal plan for how it's gonna run in the content of it. So we're gonna have you know, two payloads. Uh, they're gonna be called this and that uh, and so on. And so this is also available for you to use as um, if you wish or to reference. And here's where the sort of intelligence comes in. So how should that readme file look? How should we configure this uh, bypass UAC script? And so the, the more intelligence we have about how those things work, the more uh, we can be sure that it would work in the case of an actual adversary using it. And so we've blown out, this is what that might look like uh, from the threat. So the threat intelligence people might give this to the red team and say, okay, this is what APT29 is doing. And for this exercise, we want to emulate APT29. So please roughly or stick to this, this script when doing it. So we can say with some certainty, if APT29 is our network, they will probably execute the technique this way. And we can make sure that our detections work against that. Now, you may also want to give the red team some flexibility in what they do to explore other options that maybe the cyber threat intelligence analysts did not think of or push the boundaries of our defense more. At least this gives us a way of saying with some degree of certainty, we are protected against adversary X. Um, so uh, this is sort of what the uh, another threat informed assessment looked like for FIN6, uh, which is this group ID G37, uh, which has these associated groups. And so it has sort of objective, objectives and evolution, who they target operations. And so you try to create a plan for how, they, how to replicate what they do so others in the community can do it themselves as well. So it's not just you going home and running whatever scripts you saw, but like, Okay, first they do account discovery and then, but they might do it one of two ways. They might do it this way or that way. So maybe we have to mix it up in order to have some degree of certainty that we're uh, going to detect them. And then they'll move on to remote system discovery. So it's not just um, as simple as populating a script with 10 uh, PowerShell lines and then running that and it's calling it done. 
we try to have a little more thought about it. And this can also include things like, well, we want to go low and slow. So, you know, we're going to do something at minute zero, and then we're going to wait 30 minutes before we do the next thing. Because maybe that'll trip up our detections if they're looking for um, things happening in a short period of time. Well, the goal is always to improve. Uh, to improve uh, the red team's uh, abilities of, to improve the defensive capabilities. Uh, so we had to measure that and track progress through things like assessing our coverage and prioritizing and gaps and tuning our defenses. So this starts getting to the engineering um, aspect of uh, using attack. So we have, okay, we have this detection we want to use, but when we did the red team, we found that we've detected three different ways uh, that they might do it, uh, but we missed two. So what does that mean? Well, that means we still have a gap in our coverage for that technique for LSAS memory. Uh, or, you know, maybe they're doing different ways of, maybe uh, we're asking ourselves for credential dump, okay, we've got LSAS covered, but maybe not the others. So there's, so there's lots of different ways uh, to look at credential access specifically. So, just because you have LSS covered or uh, partially covered doesn't mean you have any of the other ones. And so uh, a lot of times we'll mark this, if you're doing a very simple one, like this is partial, so it's yellow. So in our chart, um, we might have a red, yellow, green um, way of marking things like green is we got, we'll detect it. Yellow is we'll sometimes detect it and red is we won't. And so for this specific technique, and this um, sub-technique, we are maybe. And you look at the larger chart, you know, we start looking at, okay, what other techniques do we care about? And then accept that we can't cover everything. And then for each of these, we would go through the same process of, okay, how are these threats being done? Who's or who are we caring about? Who do we care about? How can we build an analytic to detect those? And then slowly we can start populating this chart with that information. And we might, as we indicate here, we can, we're not going to cover everything. There's too much. And so we have to accept some risk some, in some places to say, you know what, either this is not used very often, or we have other things in place to mitigate it, or you know, it's just we should consider it low risk. And so we have to make those sorts of decisions when we start talking about the engineering aspects of um, our security architecture. So you want to do it one piece at a time uh, using informed decisions. Um, the assessments, and we want to do the assessments using threats because that will lead us towards knowing what are the necessary enhancements we need to make. And this is a cumulative iterative process that never stops. So uh, I'll take, for example, the network I used to run, we used to do these exercises bi-monthly to order to assess, okay, we're going to do, emulate this adversary, these techniques. Uh, we've got, let's see if we can recreate what they did, build detections for them, and then see how well they work the next time. Or do we have gaps in sensing? Or do we have gaps in our analytics? We're constantly doing that iterative process to better, to continuously improve ourselves. And this also helps the red teams because they get a, a sense of how they can be detected and it pushes them to improve their skills and different, how to execute different techniques. But ultimately, security is hard. Um, and it's easier when we coordinate and communicate and work together. And that's something attack really helps us do across all those different teams. In a lot of SOCs, those four different use cases are handled by completely different groups. You know, the CTI is handled by one group. Then you have a bunch of SOC analysts developing analytics. And then you have network engineers who are independently building up the security architecture to support the, the network defense. And we have to keep in mind why we're doing this. You know, we don't want to just get in the mindset of, okay, we're doing it to fill in boxes. We want all boxes to be in green. Uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, we want to make sure we, that we're doing this to understand our threats and have that inform our actions and decisions. That should inform why we're purchasing or installing tools. This is why we're developing these analytics uh, and so on. 
So a tag gives us a quantifiable way of understanding, tracking, communicating, and addressing what our threats are doing. And we can use this knowledge to gain strategic and operational advantages, which ultimately will hopefully uh, improve our ability to defend uh, networks as a community and not just uh, for ourselves. So, but if we all uh, speak the same language, we can all say, okay, I'm seeing command and scripting uh, using an interpreter, in this case, PowerShell. And if we're all on the same page about what that means through the attack framework, we all know what that means. You know, if we just say, I saw this thing in command line and it happens to be encoded PowerShell, nobody knows what that is necessarily. Maybe a couple experts know, but the community at large doesn't. But framing it in this way allows us as a community to understand what everybody else is talking about and allows for a degree of anonymization um, for things like companies who maybe are, are concerned about releasing too much information about a compromise in their network. Uh, so there's lots of information uh, more about these different use cases. Um, again, there's the Getting Started Tech eBook. Uh, and we also have a, not just this training, but other trainings uh, for different ways of using attack at the MITRE uh, attack um, defender um, or MAD learning courses on Cyberary. So in summary, um, this is the attack framework and it really helps us communicate with each other as well as get after a lot of the different problems uh, we're trying to address when trying to do network defense. Uh, so with that, uh, here's again the link as well as uh, the attack Twitter uh, if you want to follow them. Uh, and with that, I will open up, up to questions. And if not questions, then I will run through a quick example on the attack navigator and attack site. So there are a couple questions in the Q and A uh, button. Okay. Okay, so question number one, uh, what is the best practice to prevent an attack? You, uh, when you're talking about preventing attacks, you're looking at the mitigations on the attack page. Um, it's not a matter of just, you know, this mitigation works for everything. Um, there's an example that my uh, professor in, when I was doing my master's uh, talked about, okay. Um, that was the only secure system or computer is one that doesn't work or is encasing concrete. So uh, the more functionality or useful a system is, generally the more opportunity there is to misuse it. And so it really, when you're talking about how to prevent it, it you know, depends on the instance. Uh, so uh, I'll open the floor to events three. I'm not sure how to do that though, since they would like to answer the question. Nope, I was just <laughs> setting it up for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. You I thought uh, you were trying to answer it. <laughs> uh, so what is the best tactics? Um, again, this is very subjective. Let me bring up the attack site real quick, if I can. Uh, this is the navigator, but that'll work just as well. So... Um, this is the current version of attack. And from the attack, you see we have all these tactics groups. I would, some might say, well, the best tactic is the one that has the most techniques. In this case, that would be defense evasion. Um, some might say the opposite, say, well, you should go for the one that has the smallest number of techniques because you are more likely to be able to write all the detections or mitigations that addresses all those. Again, that's not really necessarily true, or at least not the case. So I, we have, you can think about it sometimes, like there is in, this, in terms of cyber kill chain, you know, they're gonna do this and then that and then that. And then if you can find the breakpoint in that execution, then maybe that is where you wanna focus, but that's gonna be uh, very much dependent on the specific group you're talking about. So going back to your, which specific threat you mean, um, if you want to do, if your goal is to limit the extent of compromise, maybe you want to focus on lateral movement. Because if you can lock down lateral movement, 
they can only ever exist on one system, which maybe you're max or you're minimizing your risk that way. Or maybe you say that they can't ever get credentials. Um, that will, by its nature, limit lateral movement uh, and limit them to um, limited privilege uh, executions, which will keep them from doing anything too bad. So I, the answer is there is no easy answer. It's uh, going to be up to sort of your goal and what threats you're looking at to where you kind of want to focus. Um, I personally, as a uh, developer of analytics, uh, I a lot I spend a lot of my time looking at, I would say, execution, because uh, it's kind of the easiest to start thinking about, uh, because you, a lot of times it's things like process creation. And so it's a lot easier to mentally understand what's happening there. Um, and then from there, you start thinking about, well, okay, I can see Mimi Cats here, but how do I move from Mimi Cats there to how it's really working under credential access? Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, then taking uh, the example of a cyber attack and mapping it as a deep dive. Okay, so let us take. Let's see, what is a good, I'm gonna do a schedule task because I know that one quite well, as long as I can find it. That is not what I wanted to do. Uh, so schedule task. Uh, so uh, schedule task exists in several uh, places, but it's looking at specifically execution, uh, just for example. And what, so how do you do discuss that? Perhaps we have some threat intelligence uh, that tells us so what's the threat intelligence might have told us to focus on this. So let us say we read uh, this specific uh, paper from Kapers Kaspersky. Now Kaspersky Lab is a relatively well-known antivirus vendor who publishes regular reports. So it's probably, a high degree of confidence that this is a good source. And so uh, we might look at, okay, uh, adversaries may abuse task scheduling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. And they might use it to do these kinds of things for detection. You know, what might we look at in here? You know, here's a registry key. Um, but uh, separately, you might want to do, okay, this is, this is okay information, but as a defender, maybe I want more. Um, like maybe this is what the cyber threat intelligence gave me. Like, you know, we're seeing, I've got a threat report from Kaspersky that says they're doing scheduled tasks. And they're doing scheduled tasks specifically uh, using the SCH task utility. So we might look at, okay, well, how do you create a uh, job for scheduled task. Um, well, there's um, a lot of different ways. Um, we have to do, I don't want to go into, we don't have time, we only have nine minutes to go into nitty gritty details. Uh, but on Windows, what happens is you'll create a job file, which will then also create a registry key associated with it. And then you can, Windows also has a, an event code you can configure to generate data for that. So as a, you might say, okay, if I want to look for scheduled tasks, I need to look for this. Uh, I need to configure my environment. Uh, so this would be going to the sort of engineering um, team and say, okay, I need you guys to collect this specific event code, uh, which is 3698, if I'm not mistaken, or 4698. I'll double check. 4698, here it is. Um, 4698 events from Windows hosts. Uh, so push out that group policy. Okay, once that's pushed out, um, now go to the SOC analyst and say, okay, uh, are we collecting that data? Yes. Is it getting to the SOC or SIEM or whatever data analysis platform we're using? Uh, yeah, if yes, then we can write an analytic for that. And then we can write an analytic uh, that covers it. Uh, so that could be looking at that specific event code. It could be, uh, taking something else from this information, like 
uh, using this specific field or different arguments. Um, it kind of depends on going a level deeper, level of detail deeper onto which specific execution method you're looking for. Now, once that's built, you would then go to your threat emulation team and say, okay, I need you to do run schedule tasks as um, in the same method as say Loki bot. Um, and then make sure that, that works for our specific detection. And then you do a gap analysis of whether or not that worked. And then you can go to attack, do, 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 do. It's the create a new empty one for enterprise or the navigator, I mean. And say something, okay, for scheduled tasks, where is scheduled tasks? Uh, for scheduled tasks, I can detect it, let's say, um, 100% percent let's call it green, because it's easy. May not be true, but um, let's just start with that. And then you might go through several iterations of that. Uh, then eventually what you might um, do is you might have several of those. So let's grab the group tool. I'm gonna quickly try to do the layer composite example. Let us select everything for, let's see, let's grab 28. Uh, so these are all the techniques of so the APT28. So we grabbed all of them already. And then I want to score them uh, as one. And then I will call this layer, uh, it's called APT28. I think that's an H. My screen is not big enough to support that size, unfortunately. Uh, then we'll create another layer. Um, and then for enterprise as well. And we'll call uh, grab, let's call it APT3 this time. And score those as two. and call this layer something else. APT3. And then finally create a, a layer from other layers. Uh, so here's a little more complicated. Uh, so we're gonna do an enterprise one uh, and the expression uh, is going to be based, you have to do a mathematical expression based on the content of the layer. So in this case, it's up here, it's been labeled A and B. And so we can do stuff like A plus B. And so now when we bring up the new map, uh, what we'll see is a composite score across both of those. And so now we have a heat map, which shows us uh, what's red. You can configure this color scale. Um, but what's red is one, so that is unique to APT 28. Um, what is labeled two or is yellow is unique to APT 3. And what's green is what's common to both. And so now if we're talking about sort of prioritizing which techniques you want to start addressing, this is a method we could use. We say, okay, these are the two adversaries I care about. What are, let's start with the techniques that are common to both. Okay, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So we'll start, I'll focus our efforts on understanding and creating defenses for these six. And then maybe we'll move to ones that are unique to one or the other, or we'll use another prioritization scheme. So that's the idea. And you can do this with, uh, you could create another layer, which is your detection. So you might create a th another layer or a scale of task example, which is, well, we detect this one. And so maybe we'll, reset the value to zero if uh, they have a common one. So now, or we'll set it to some really high number. And so, well, if it's, we have it covered, it'll be, you know, a hundred plus. And so we know which ones of these techniques we have covered versus which adversaries we care about. And so that's some of the ways we can use uh, this. Um, 
any other questions or did that help answer your question? I'm sorry, uh, if you really want to get into nitty gritty details of converting cyber threat intelligence into useful information for defenders, you're, uh, you have to go to the um, MAD training uh, for the cyber threat intelligence specifically, because that's a separate course. You have three minutes to ask any other questions, hopefully related to this topic. Now I can go back, clarify something if you didn't get it the first time um, or anything like that. But the slides that you mentioned will be released as will the video. And if you want to take the slower paced, uh, more piecemeal training, then um, that is also on the attack uh, MAD site. So let me go there real quick. So we are publicly releasing um, these different modules. And so you just went through the fundamentals which was uh, this first uh, section. Um, but there are other additional modules like the cyber threat intelligence and forum assessments. We are, uh, where's, it's been too, a layer too deep. Uh, but there's also a course for, or we're working on the one for hunting right now, which will be released hopefully soon. Uh, and the courses are free. Uh, to uh, take, but the certification costs money. So you are free to watch the courses as you wish. Uh, with that, uh, we are out of time. So thank you very much for your time. And hopefully it was insightful and feel free to uh, email the attack team if you have any other questions.